Nice round of applause for our, uh, the rest of our panel. Srivas, nice to meet you. Hey, great to meet you. I think it's easiest uh, if we just have you guys introduce yourselves, since you uh, know your careers better than I do. So uh, why don't we start with Tak? You want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Taku. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of PTIX. Uh, we started our event and ticketing uh, service out of Tokyo, Japan in 2011, and since then expanded uh, into Singapore, Malaysia, and elsewhere. Great. Shreyas? Uh, hi, I run a company called Insider.in in India. Uh, we ticket events across music, comedy, uh, and sports across about 70 cities in India. We started in 2014, and before that, I used to be uh, associated with a company which produced music festivals and comedy events in India called OMA. Wow. Yep, go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Hi, my name's uh, Mike Hill. I'm a, a co founder and CEO of a company called Magnetic Asia based out of Hong Kong. Um, we produce a number of events, um, including Clock and Flap and Sonar Hong Kong, and Neon Lights in in, uh, in Singapore. And we also are, um, own and run a company called Ticket Flap, which uh, provides ticketing services uh, out of Hong Kong, um, Singapore, and we're just expanding into China and Taiwan and Japan. Wow, we're expanding quickly. <laughs> so I think the the key point for this panel here is that we have four people from four different territories. So um, we're going to explore the, how his ticketing is different in each territory. I um, think maybe I want to start with you, Mike. Maybe you can uh, give some explanation about ticketing in, in Hong Kong particularly, and, and the, maybe even the areas you're planning to expand to, and how it, how, what specifically the challenges are in Hong Kong. So we, um, the reason we started Ticket Flap was to respond to a, a problem that we faced with our festival. Fortunately, we also had a technology business, that, was, that happened to be my, my original background, um, and my other company was a technology company. So we, the problem that we had in Hong Kong was that it was m basically uh, dominated by s the incumbents, which would be HK Ticketing, uh, City Line, and Herptix, and they um, were very much venue-oriented. They weren't used to doing um, outdoor events, so the technology wasn't set up for it. And it was also entirely dominated by physical tickets. And, it's, and to be to it, a part really is still the same now in Hong Kong. The, most of the players are focused on physical tickets, and we were very much focused on on the new approaches to marketing, digital marketing, etc. And um, and so online ticketing was, as far as we were concerned, was the only way forward. Um, and so we responded to that by by creating uh, Ticket Flap. And then from there, it's we've we've continued really be, to be the dominant player in, in that space, uh, on the, in the online space. And it's, it, it, it kind of works uh, in that they look after the venues and we look after everything else, right? Um, I think as we go into different parts of the region, we're finding different challenges. Um, Singapore is more progressive in terms of its, there's more uh, digital ticketing solutions here. Um, so that's where it's, we're finding it more competitive and more challenging. Um, Taiwan's exciting for us, much more similar to, to Hong Kong, and we see great opportunities there in terms of digital ticketing. Um, okay, cool. We'll, we'll drill into that more later, but that, that's a great introduction. How about Shreyas? Can you talk about India, the particular challenges in India? Yeah, um, I, think, I think in 2010, India was pretty much the Wild West, right? Uh, event ticketing in India <coughs> was mostly dominated by offline ticketing till about 2010. I think in the last three, four years, we have seen like a fundamental shift. Today, 75 to 80 percent of tickets for events are bought on your cell phone or bought through mobile. And that's pretty much become the biggest distribution for us. Um, I, as a festival organizer of one of the biggest festivals in India, I think the most important thing for us and when we started the ticketing business was to really innovate on how tickets are discovered, how tickets are bought, and how loyalty is ensured. I think those are the three biggest points for any festival promoter. And we wanted to build a we wanted to build a solution around it. And and a lot like him, I come from an open source background. I did a lot of hacking work in college, so I thought uh, I know the problem statement the best, so I might as well build it. That's interesting. Also, we'll we'll drill into that a little bit more. But let's hear from Taku first. And uh, you have a unique system in Japan. Uh, yeah, Japan is. I, I think uh, well, like any uh, country, uh, Japan has its idiosyncrasies. Thank God, Live Nation and Ticketmaster is not in Japan in a big way. But yeah. we have our uh, big three ticketing companies that have been around for decades. One is um, a company called Pia. 
Uh, another one is uh, E Plus, which is owned by Sony Music and credits is on a credit card issuer. Uh, and the other is Lawson, a the second largest convenience store chain. Right. Um, and ticketing is very different in Japan in that it is dominated by the convenience store chains. In fact, Pia is owned by 7-Eleven Japan, 30%. Um, and, and the whole game there is to, they, they said, we don't care about making any profits and money through ticketing itself, as long as we can send people over to the convenience stores and they right. pay for the ticket and print out their tickets at the convenience stores and then buy um, a rice ball along the way. Right. That's or the way something. they make money. Right. So it's, it's a way, it's a method for them to send traffic into their stores. So uh, Ptix, my company, uh, it made no sense as a startup to go up, like, how do you compete against big companies that don't care about making money. Right. Um, and so we've avoided that, purposely avoided that segment of big box entertainment, the, the big sporting events and the Taylor Swifts and the AKB4, um, the big idol uh, concerts and, and whatnot. What we focus on are long tail uh, community events. I average is somewhere between 30 to 50 people uh, getting together around common interests and ideas, and it, I, I think we're much more similar to Eventbrite in the U.S. or or Meetup.com in the U.S. Right, right, right. Um, let's drill into that a little bit, since uh, I think people probably don't know a lot about Japan. So, first of all, um, you're basically only online, right? You're we are 100% online. Right. We are a very small team of 40 people. Um, everything is self-service. We have a self-service -ser UI. Right. 99 plus percent of our events, we just they they you know the customers come to our site and uh, publish th their events uh, without our assistance. So oh, right. So it's like user generated. Yes, user generated. And we just felt that as a startup, there are more um, problems that can be solved by us uh, in that sort of small event space. You know, right. first and foremost, they want people to come to their events. Of course, yeah. I don't think Taylor Swift cares about getting more people really, <laughs> you know, it's going to sell out. And Well, she does, but it's going to sell out anyway. Right, it's going to sell out, right. Um, our customers, the majority of our customers, it, again, They've uh, secured a venue for 50 people and they're scared out of their wits a week before the event because right. only 15 people have ordered tickets or something. So as we build our database, what we've done, uh, we've built recommendation algorithms. We have an app where we feature noteworthy events and we try to s send more attendees to your events. And that, that's, in fact, we make more money that way uh, rather than ticketing fees. Oh, that's interesting. So I want to pull back a little bit uh, to talk about Japan because I think that people maybe don't know. So first of all, I think the general impression of Japan is that, you know, it's a highly online society and, you know, very digitally uh, sophisticated. But I would suggest and see if you agree that actually, for example, in the ticketing industry, mm -hmm. it's probably much more analog, much more actual physical tickets than other markets, specifically Europe and North America, let's say. Yes, very behind, but very advanced in many other ways as well. The convenience store system, the way all the systems are integrated, it's magical. You know, you, you, you pay for your ticket on your phone. You go to one of the kiosks that are across about 60,000 locations across the country, punch some buttons, and your, print, your ticket is... Sure, out. but I think in but a lot of other territories, people wouldn't bother to print a ticket, right? They exactly. Would just, they would just keep the ticket on their phone digitally. I mean, yeah, so I, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it is still paper ticket form. Right, which is surprising, I think, maybe for for other ticket ticketing right. uh, professionals in the in the room. Yeah, I I obviously <laughs> spend a lot of time in the U.S. too, and I'm just amazed how everything is on your phone. And right. In Japan, it's very much. There's a level of trust. I think there's little fraud in Japan that can happen, so that the paper tickets seem to work well, and the convenience stores obviously want it that way. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, this, this is the, the kind of point that I wanted to make overall, is that you have these two things, which is very different than other markets. I mean, everything, or not everything, but a lot of things are convenience store driven, particularly the ticketing market. I don't think that really exists anywhere I'm else. I'm not in the sure. World. Maybe it exists in India. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, no. No, no, right? So it's pretty unusual, right? That, that it's, it's convenience a very, store driven. It's yeah. a lot like Ticketmaster in the 80s and the 90s. <laughs> so, so does it sound like Ticketmaster in the 80s and the 90s, team? <laughs> We're, um, everything's gone to mobile. Also, our, our, our deals are with the venues, so we are expected to provide all the technology that exists in the venues, like the turnstiles and the scanners, right. to prevent fraud, and, and so they don't have to have ushers. And, and we're also providing um, content now as part of Live Nation, as right. part of the deal. So convenience stores, I don't even know what a convenience store is, really. <laughs> They're very different in yeah. Japan. I don't know if you've yeah. been yeah. there. I think people know what convenience so these are. Cultural, so these are just cultural barriers to entry. Yeah. Uh, that in the olden days, uh, Myers had, um, we used to have our outlets in Myers, but so we don't have outlets anymore. The same way as people don't buy f tickets on the phone. Right. Uh, that, that's just something that will erode over time. Yeah. Or not. I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to point. The point that I'm trying to make is that the Japanese market is very different. Whether it erode over time or not, who knows? I mean, they're already... Got to uh, find a more compelling... Still, still printing paper tickets when that's sort of passe in a lot, a lot of other well, markets. From, uh, it's going to take time. Uh, yeah, it will erode over time. From, from the ownership structure, they have a very strong incentive to keep things the way they are. Right. And uh, exactly. as a startup, I just can't wait for that to happen. So I'm, I'm just trying to play a different game. Right, right, exactly. Well, that's exactly the point that I'm trying to make, is that your system is quite revolutionary for Japan and really out of the mainstream of what exists today. So what, what is interesting, and we're seeing this increasingly recently, you know, we've built our database. We have over 3 million customers in our database in Japan. Uh, and now the entertainment folks are starting to come to us to, you know, sort of get new attendees into their live events. And, you know, we just uh, handle some ticketing for the Fuji Rock Festival, which is the biggest um, music festival in Japan. So well, actually, it's not, but that's okay. To, yeah, that, that, that has been our, uh, you know, our thought. You know, right. eventually, if we, if we become big enough, they'll come to us. And right. it's, it's starting to happen. Right. Um, we, we can go, Fuji Rock Festival is maybe the most famous festival in Japan. It's not even close to the biggest rock festival in Japan. There's three festivals that are bigger, right? Yeah, they're bigger. And, you know, uh, who knows when we'll get there, but right, you know, right. uh, this summer has been sort of, it, it's been a pleasant great. experience for us great. because we thought it would take another five years or so. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. I'll come back to it because I think there's a lot of things in your platform which are really unusual but Japan, mm -hmm. but let's move on so, so other people can. Shriyas, you were, you were talking about the, the issues that you have in India and, and some of the challenges, perhaps uh, loyalty or something like that. You could expand on that a little bit. Um, yeah, I, 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 I talk a bit about the loyalty side, and we sample users a lot. Uh, we ask users, why did you buy a ticket, right? And surprisingly, every year, and we've been doing this for three years, 70% of the audience say they bought a ticket because of their friend, right? One of their friends is going, he evangelized the event to them, and considerably across the industry, we still spend more money on Facebook and Google than on your friend. That seems illogical, right? right? Uh, so you take an insight like that and you drill that down to a feature, right? So what would that mean on a product? On a product, that would mean if you can, if you can on a per event basis, if you can convince your friend to go, you unlock a better price, right? And, and you circumvent some, some of the distribution almost like um, logic which is embedded into people that you have to spend money on print. On the survey, print, radio, television track less than 5%. Wow. Right? It absolutely has no impact on ticketing or distribution anymore. That's amazing. Right? All impact on distribution is how much buzz does your event have and do you have a friend in your circle who wants to go? Right? If you drill, drill down inside to that level of basic, you can actually do a lot with it. Wow, that's really incredible. But so, I mean, it, it strikes me as not surprising, but, but then on the other hand, surprising, because we know that word of mouth is incredibly important in India, but also it is a fairly, you know, 
online society. So Facebook and Instagram, you're saying they don't really have a big impact on, no, on sales? Uh, people get to know from their friends on Facebook and Instagram. Right. I, I meant on advertising. Oh, uh, I see. I, I, I see. meant Facebook advertising and Instagram advertising. We've consistently seen most amount of traffic come from WhatsApp, which is the biggest chat application in India. Right, right. And, and friends sharing on Facebook and Instagram. Right. Right, right. And from your perspective, I mean, have you, you seen real growth in the market? That, that's what I would expect, but yeah, I want to um, ask you about it. Yeah, massive. Uh, I think um, there are pretty much uh, two players in the market in India today. There's, there's Book My Show as a market leader and who's been around for a decade. And then there's us and we've been around for three years. Uh, and uh, we've pretty much tripled our business in the last year. Uh, predominantly on the back of uh, entry into sports, and sports is huge in India. We have two large leagues. We have a cricket league called IPL, which, uh, which does about 40, 50,000 people per game, nine games a team, 10 games, so huge wow. volumes. Uh, then there's music and comedy. Uh, large scale music festivals are still not as big as the rest of the world, uh, but there's also very interesting formats we work with retail uh, retail outlets on events within retail outlets which are huge scale we work on shopping festivals which do 100,000 people a weekend so there's a wide variety of events and and a lot of smaller cities in India are just about starting to get into organized events right we are talking about 70 cities last year which ticketed with us and most of them did two three events in a year wow. so we see them going to 100 events in the next two three years and wow. the volume we are seeing coming out of india is just going to be incredible so you're talking about massive massive growth yeah we, we, we're talking about like doing tens of millions of tickets in the next few years wow wow okay well we'll come back to that i mean i think that's a fer fertile ground to discuss more but let's move on to to mike and hong kong um, so what, what would you say are some of the specific challenges then of the Hong Kong market? Um, the biggest challenge in, in, in the Hong Kong market, certainly from the consumer's perspective, is, is the fact that the, uh, the monopolies that are, that are in place with regards to the venues. So, the ven so it's very hard for the, um, the organizers or the hosts of an event to be able to choose which ticketing platform that they want to use. You find in many markets, you find a situation where there is many, many ticketing platforms available um, to the to the organisers, and it's not locked into those venues, which obviously creates uh, an advantage both for the event organiser because they can access multiple databases, but it also creates a huge benefit for the consumer as well because they get to choose how they want to consume that particular product. Um, it then creates all sorts of other um, challenges uh, for the for the organisers in terms of um, choices around cash flow. Um, because obviously certain providers would be able to provide them better deals on cash flow and other providers wouldn't. So it becomes really quite, um, really quite uh, difficult really for, for, all, for all concerned parties. Um, so this is something that we're have pushing hard uh, to try to, to get a change to happen and get the, the various bodies to understand that it's actually not in anybody's interest to have these kind of uh, monopolies in place. I think that's really the, uh, and at the moment we're also seeing uh, sort of a, a byproduct of this um, is is the secondary markets are becoming really a problem in Hong Kong because of this. We have this great phrase in Hong Kong: Hong Kong ticket touts are called yellow cows. Um, What's that? Yellow cows. Oh, I see. Is a sec is a is a ticket tout or a scalper. So you'll yellow see cow. A yellow cow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll remember that. I'm not quite sure why they're called yellow cows, but they are. Anyway, it gives a quite great vision in your mind. Um, also very holy in India. So they are <laughs> yellow cows in India. They'd be untouchable. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Because of the monopoly situation, we're finding that the physical tickets and, and how to respond to the to the to the, the ticket tout situation means that the organisers don't have a lot of choices um, to be able to switch to, to ticketing platforms such as ours, which has got built-in ticket anti-ticket tout mechanisms. Um, so this again is, is is something that we're seeing. Uh, it's gonna. I think we're gonna we're gonna really see a lot of problems with this over the next 12 months, um, as as this ticket touting situation really starts to take hold in Hong Kong. It sounds trivial to maybe other markets where ticket touting has been going on uh, using via GoGo or the other or the likes of this for years. Um, but it's in Hong Kong. It's still really in its sort of nascent um, period. It's it, of, of 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 really seeing the the, the, the real negative effects of right. secondary markets. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I want to throw that question to the whole panel. Hopefully, 
you guys can can talk about your market. How big a problem is secondary ticketing or scalping, as we call it, in your market? Do you find it to be a big problem? And uh, is there any way to address it, or is it just something you have to live with? Well, I can address. I'm an expert in this. <laughs> I've been dealing with this for years. Um, look. 35 years ago, when I started in the ticketing business, ticket tights, as they're called in Europe, or ticket scalpers, or whatever you want to call them, were um, guys in long coats outside venues and buildings. Looking like they'd molest children, yeah, those kind saying, of guys. Do you want to buy a ticket? Yeah. Um, and then with, you know, and then with the, uh, the advent of the internet, it exploded, because then everybody could, everybody could become a ticket broker. And now, when you say to someone scalping, no one really can no no one can really define it. So, as someone who buys four tickets and sells two of them, is that a scalper? No one really knows. Right. So, when you go to governments, and every every state in Australia has either introduced legislation or is about to introduce legislation. When you ask a politician, what are you def define it, they can't actually define it. Right. Um, but they're bringing in legislation anyway. And it means nothing because companies um, who are offshore in every jurisdiction don't abide by any laws anyway. So they just keep going along right. doing what they're always doing. And the companies like Ticketmaster, Resale, we abide by every law. And we have done everything we can to stop it. We right. have deflected billions of bots. We have whole you know, departments all over the world trying to stop bots getting, we don't want bots. Right. We've done right. everything. So essentially you have like a, a technical division. A, uh, yeah, a, a, a I mean we supported Obama's yeah. legislation in the US to, right. to um, outlaw bots. Right. We have supported the Australian government, the UK government, the French, whatever government in the world do outlaw bots, it has made no difference. Right. Um, we have supported every, we abide by every consumer legislation everywhere and we abide by it. The others, don't, the bad guys, don't listen to any. Of course. And they just keep doing it. And the result of that is, our market share has diminished, and theirs has grown at the same rate, and the consumer is getting ripped off more and more. Right. So my personal view is, we as an industry, that means the promoter, the agent, the artist, the ticketing company, the venue, we have to keep working at this together to right. try and stop it because just pointing at each other and going, you have to do something about this is not going to make a change. Right. And stopping the poor Mr. and Mrs. Average at the door and taking their tickets off them and going, you can't come in because you bought that from a broker is not the answer because that's like stopping a drug user and not dealing with the dealers. We have to actually stop it. At, we have to actually work collectively to, to do something about it. To stop the. the right, stop and that's what, you know, Ticketmaster and Lime, what's we're trying to do. We're actually looking at it holistically by, you know, verified fan and digital tickets and ticket limits and all the other things that we're doing. But we all have to work together. It's not an easy thing to do. Right. Because the bad guys are acting with impunity, they don't care. Right, of course. As they always do. I mean, yeah, it's a blight on if the they obeyed the law, then there wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, just, there's, exactly. So we have to work on it together, and it's not going to go away. Legislation's right. not going to fix it. T uh, everything, nothing's going to fix it. Yeah. It's always been there. It's always going to be there. And yeah. we have to work on it together. Right, right. And we have to deploy all the things, pricing, technology, um, practices, operations, everything to, to try and um, make it, minimize it. Right. That's right. my per right. personal view. Sure. So uh, I have a, maybe my take on this is a bit from naivety because we don't have a secondary uh, ticketing problem in India. We do have problems around secondary ticketing if people buy from the box office window, which happens mostly in sports when it's happening in the smaller cities. But I, one of the things I think as an industry we have not done very well is we've actually not... Uh, grown technology at the same scale as which secondary ticket sellers have grown their technology, right? And I'll tell you what I mean by that. I, I think secondary pricing is a, is a market problem. 
I think we've always underpriced our tickets for the last 20 years because most artists are very wary about having very high prices because they think their fans are going to look down on them, right? Most artists want to be a working man artist and hence prices start very low and then what it, it automatically allows the market to hold tickets and sell it higher because the market value of those tickets are higher. The way to solve them, at least in my opinion, is, is to do interesting pricing models, which could be dynamic pricing, which could be eBay-style um, 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 marketplaces where you're bidding on tickets and you establish a date. But we haven't done a lot of that. We Because it's always sold out, once you sell out, your incentive on changing something is fairly limited. Right. Right? In India, we have the other problem, right? We're still growing as a market, so a lot of concerts don't sell out. So we are incentivized to do a lot of these models, right? We always have a dynamic scale model where the people who buy the earliest get the cheapest tickets, right? These are fans who support you, who buy tickets before our lineup is announced. We want to reward them with really cheap tickets. And then we allow people to transfer tickets easily without any problem. But we take... Uh, we allow how many, I mean, limit the number of times a phone number can be transferred to a ticket. Right. And we always verify IDs when people pick it up at the box office. So it's a, that problem, in my opinion, can be solved if we fix pricing properly. But that's, it's very, it's much easier said than done. I mean, as a, as a, as a, both a ticketing company and a, a what we would refer to as a promoter, um, with an event, as you say, that's, that's not sell out, um, you're, you're constantly in this this state this this position of trying to get the pricing right to avoid not p it being too expensive versus being just the right price, right? Um, and there is this talk of the dynamic ticketing, even like to use the airlines model, uh, dynamic ticketing as being potentially the holy grail of this. But there's no real proven models yet to actually demonstrate how that really successfully works for a non-sellout event? I mean, maybe, I'm, I'm not that I'm aware of. Have you, have you seen? So we've actually done a fair number of experiments on that. And, and we find three pointers to an event which, which always tracks on ticket sales. Uh, organic traffic, direct, and uh, search engine traffic always is a great indicator of ticket sales. Uh, so even if tickets don't sell, but organic traffic tracks really well, we've seen that tickets end up selling towards the very end. Uh, so we have done some experiments. We haven't we haven't moved out to a completely automated solution right now. We have machine learning models which throw some results, and there's somebody sitting and saying yes or no on it. Uh, but I, we, we have, I mean, it's promising. What we are seeing, we think uh, there can be a technology solution. The the really tricky thing is uh, airlines have culturally been okay with prices going up and down. Uh, that's going to be a problem in events. You can't have People, yeah, we, we can't have tickets go down. So tickets have to move up, and they have to move up very slowly. And you have to make sure that you track the pointers really, really well. well the problem is that the airline owns the seats on the plane. And you've got to That's the problem. Sorry, sorry, say that again? Right. The airline owns the inventory. The promoter doesn't own the inventory. The ticketing company doesn't right. own the, the inventory. It, yeah. The artist the has artist to owns say... It. Yeah. So by the time you go can we up the chain to say, can we re reduce the price, it's too late as well, right? That we don't own the seats. Right. Well, and, and then you add to that, I mean, you, you touched on it, but the, the fact is, is that one, the artist doesn't want their fans to look down on them, but a lot of the fans are kids. They don't want to outprice the, you know, the kids who don't have the money to pay $200 a ticket or $400 a ticket. Yeah. So essentially, it's impossible to charge the higher end you know, what the ticket may actually be worth in the marketplace. There's just one thing, I'm in, I don't know what it's like in other markets, but in Australia and New Zealand, one of the biggest things that has created trading and tickets is the no exchange or refund. So, you know, what else do you buy for a year away where they say no exchange or refund? That has to change because that's not fair. It's actually against Australian consumer law, but we can talk about that later. The, you buy something now in not, for something that's happening in nine months, and there's nothing you can do. So you're supposed to say, okay, I'll just wipe that $500 off because right. I've been transferred, I'm dying of cancer, my, you know, I'm sick or whatever. And you ring up and you go, I can't go, and they go, tough, no exchange or refund. So that makes people put them up on sites to sell them right. because the industry doesn't allow you to bring them back. Yeah, but then if, as, a, as a promoter, you're investing 
gazillions of dollars in, 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 in content and, and then at some point in time people, people are buying this inventory and holding that inventory and then at any given moment they can release that inventory. That's there you go. That, you're creating a trading... But of course, but that's, is that, that's not a problem though, is it? Why, why is it in every, in, every, in, every, in, every, in every situation... A free you. market is acceptable. Well, I don't. I don't actually say no, that. No, no, hold on, hold on. First of all, that, that's law. not a solution one person has to solve, right? That solution's been solved by insurance guys over and over and over again, right? For instance, we give we allow people to buy a ticket insurance, right? You can only cancel your ticket by doing by buying the insurance, mm -hmm. and then the offset of the risk of the ticket being cancelled is transferred from the promoter to the insurance company. So Live Nation currently provides full refunds for its ticket holders. Is that is that for, for all tickets that you purchase globally on Live Nation, you can get a full refund at is any point? Is that right? Oh, I didn't well, know that. Because that was one of the issues. We just stop one of these. If you go to your consumer, look, uh, if you go to your consumer affairs, and you say, "Well, I had to sell them because I can't use them," you're going to lose every time. So if you can take away one of the barriers. The industry is going to have to look at some of the things it's doing that's creating the secondary market. And our stats show that a 46% of tickets traded on sites are just normal people who can't use the tickets. And they're buying them sometimes 16 months ahead. Right. right. So if you take that away, there'll be half of the tickets that are being traded. Right. But then Live Nation, so Ticketmaster US has just launched the, the ability to, for people to sell that, to do exactly that with a 15% yeah. markup. So that's a, that, I think that's a positive thing. It's acceptance of the fact that there is a need to transfer tickets and to be able to allow people to do it. But my, the question is, why would they do that instead of just getting a full refund if, the, if they're allowed to get a full refund? You should get a refund if you want one, or you can trade it. But why would Ticketmaster go to the trouble of building all that technology to be able to, uh, I guess, because they make 15%, of course. <laughs> but the point is... It's just it, an option, right? It's straight consumer law. If you, you, the industry is saying, oh, it's terrible, but they're creating half of it themselves by not uh, just following through. If you buy a pair of shoes, and you take them back the next day and say, I'm sorry, they, they say, oh, I'm sorry, no exchange or refund, you'd be complaining. What's the difference? Okay, I want to take a step back and uh, I, I want to address the artist problem because I've spent a lot of time talking to artists about this exact solution. And they have a very simple question. Sure, I'm happy to give my fans a lower ticket, but can you tell me who my fan is? Well, I mean, they're supposed to know that themselves. No, 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 okay. no, no. Yes. Not, not individually addressable, right? I am sure there's enough data on this table to be able to take an email address and say how many shows of an artist has this fan attended, right? Like we are now allowing artists to see grading systems saying these are your top 10%, right? Go ahead and give them a better rate because right. they've previously attended your shows and we have tracking history of them doing it. Yeah, right? that's a great and, idea. That's a great idea. And we allow people to follow artists on, on a page and then you get notifications first and you build a loyalty model on it, right? And traditionally, I get, I, I can't say this enough. I am constantly worried that ticketing is going to be so commoditized because most discovery today happens on social. If that doesn't worry us, right, I think there's something wrong. We need to build systems where discovery is so strong and loyalty is so strong that at, they discover the best events on our websites, on our apps, and not, not on social media sites. Well, I mean, that, that's a separate issue, but I think it's a good idea. Yeah. So I just want to add th one thing. In Japan, I think uh, uh, the, the industry has possibly found uh, a solution that works a little better. Um, one of the, the, the more popular artists, they have the fan clubs, paid annual memberships. Yep. Uh, you, all, you can only get access t um, to the tickets by that artist if you are a paid member, a paying member of that fan club, and it works quite well, it seems. So, I, I, I mean, although the secondary ticketing market is quite large, it's the problem maybe, perhaps, is not as severe as in other markets. So yeah. that's one way to do it. I mean, I think that there's two good points there. One of them is kind of murky. We can investigate it. But yeah, the, the fan club system works really well for, for loyal fans, as Trias talked about. And, and I think that's a great idea. I mean, going back to his point, the, yeah. You know, 
and clearly, the, the, you know the the grateful right. dead did that in 1970s. Sure, it's not a new sure. idea. It's not a new idea, but it's a great idea. It should be used more. Then going into the secondary ticketing market in Japan, I mean, then it gets really murky, right? Because this actually is a big problem in Japan, know, but it's so really it, a it's, systemic it's a problem. It's a big business. Um, what happened in Japan last year? There was a startup called Ticket Camp, uh, acquired by a public company called Mixi. Uh, in the industry took issue with it and they were forced to shut it down. There's some legislation that's about to happen. What happened though, because that site shut down, it went underground again. Nobody knows where. I imagine Yahoo Auctions, which is the eBay of Japan. Right. Um, it, they have, a, and Mercari, which is a startup, a huge startup that just went public. A lot of the secondary uh, purchases happened there. Um, it re sort of reminds me of the N Napster thing back in the day. Right. Uh, my personal opinion is that the indus industry might have been able to deal with it in a better way, not shutting it down, but really just understanding it and perhaps working together. Just as maybe, I don't know too uh, well enough about it, but StubHub is, seems to be a, a, a business that's well accepted in the U.S. market. Different culture. Yeah. yeah, I mean. So you what want, we did yeah. is, uh, I'm vice president of Live Performance Australia, and we have a ticketing code of practice. And what we've done is, we have invited some of the brokers or the, some of the ticket brokers in Australia to become members of Live Performance Australia, so that they're bound by the code of practice, and they have some of them have joined. Therefore, they're, w there's transparency over what they're doing. They have signed up. Therefore, if they don't follow the code, the industry can go to them and say, you're not, right. you know, you're not looking after the customer, you're not doing the right thing. I think shutting people out only makes them, drives them underground. Bringing them into the industry so the industry can say, we don't like this, we don't like that, is a better way of um, conducting it rather than pretending, you know, driving them away. Right, and I mean, I think the discussion that we had earlier is quite fruitful. I'm glad that Mike is also a promoter as well as a, a, a ticket seller because that represents an, a, a position that, I mean, this is a serious issue that the, the ticket sellers and the promoters need to work out so it's fair for everybody. I mean, he's right in saying that there's a lot of investment and, you know, if someone's going to hold the inventory for a long time and then just sell it back to them or, you know, get a refund, that really hurts promoters if a lot of people were doing that. But, no, I understand Property your point as well. Property say yeah. that as well about, the, you know. So, basically, the, the so answer is the I industry. Mean, the, the Go argument, ahead, Mike. I mean, the argument against that is, is I mean, somebody's taking a huge amount of risk and, and, and uh, I don't, you, you're, you're pulling a face that you don't believe we're taking a lot of risk. But every, everybody in retail would say that. You know, the guy who owns the store says, I've paid rent, I've got all this stuff, you can't have your money back on your shoes. But then uh, it's interesting, though, that you, you assume that the analogy holds, holds firm. Why, not, every, not every single market, every market is governed by different rules. And this is a different type of market. This is, this is events for tickets. Um, it's not... It's not a, a, a it's not an item of footwear, right? So so I'm not I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm actually interest, genuinely interested by this idea of, of of providing full refunds as a mechanism for actually solving this problem, not solving the problem, but addressing one of the concerns. And I actually would we, we're gonna I'm gonna take this away and go back to our team and actually discuss this because I'm actually genuinely interested in it. Um, what do you think is the percentage of people who cancel? I have a number because uh, we just did it. Yeah, I, I don't know actually. It'd be really interesting. I mean, we see it we see it a lot on Facebook. We see it on all sorts of different platforms. Yeah. We see it on on uh, you know the, the classic reselling platforms um, that but there's people are actually selling them below face value or at face value as opposed to the, the scalpers which are obviously selling them at you know multiples of, of the of the face value no. and they're the, they're the con they're the concerns so it, it definitely is an interesting an interesting approach but I still I still interested though by the fact that even though you do provide full refunds as a company it still makes sense for you to have a resale platform below face value I find it interesting that there would even be a market for that if people can get a full refund and I don't I don't understand it would be interesting to understand that I don't know about North America it's a totally different marketplace 
So you wouldn't, you don't, you wouldn't have that. I also, I also think you're confusing the user use case and the business use case. No, I'm not confusing no, either. One, <laughs> the cancellation's a user use case. The yeah. secondary is a business use case. Yeah, of course. Right. It, the, the people do secondary because it's high, high margin business. Yeah, of course. Right. But the point is, is that the Ticketmaster have recently released a platform that I allows understand. people to but resell their tickets. The right. On the secondary business. Yes, I understand. Right? But yes, yes. I'm saying that's a business use case. Of course. But the, my point is, as a consumer, why would I resell my ticket, go to the trouble of putting it on a resale platform, if I can get a full refund without any of the trouble of putting it on a resale platform? Because you're it, a scalper. Well, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not sure if it's a no, scalper or not. A different, no, the, the point is, Ticketmaster has released a platform to get rid of scalping by not allowing you to sell above face value. There is no scalp because you're not allowed to sell above market rate, sure. right? Sure. Yes, yeah. the word is controlled scalping. Yeah. I mean, to tell you the truth, uh, maybe Maria no, no, knows I better. I what you're saying. I, I mean, sorry, uh, I, I, I just want to give you some numbers because we just did 5% premium on the ticket, 100% can cancellation backed by an insurance, yes. uh, adoption rate of 8%, uh, cancellation of 6.5% of the 8%, I mean, so, 80% of those who bought the insurance canceled it. Net premium positive for the insurance company. So they continue to be in this business and we continue to offer it as a product because travel does this and travel does it well, right? right. So I'm saying there's, there's multiple solutions to it. I mean, that's one solution. Of course, the consumer is bearing the cost of paying for the insurance then. So it actually is raising their, their price if, a little if, bit. If you want the flexibility to cancel, you, you pay a small premium. Right, right. Right. Makes sense. Right. I, I, I don't disagree at all. Right. Yeah. Yes. right. yeah. No, I think that's fair. All right. Maybe we've beat this issue to death, but I do like the fact that there's a pu opposing viewpoints on it. That's always good. I, I want to um, <laughs> go back to one thing on um, uh, talk because I think that people maybe didn't focus on your platform is really community-based in a way that I don't really know about other ticketing platforms. Maybe I can ask Trias about this in India, but you know, you have people who are using the platform, creating their own events and offering tickets for their events on your platform. Like that wouldn't exist in Ticketmaster. You can't have somebody come to you and go like, oh, I, I'm not a promoter. I'm, I don't do anything, but I want to offer my events on Ticketmaster. Somebody yeah, you we, don't know. Yeah, we do on our um, the Universe platform or on TicketWeb, just not on the host. Just not on the main yeah. service. Okay. But um, yeah, so our approach has been different. Our philosophy is different. Um, one third of our events are so-called uh, you know, business seminars and whatnot. I'd say one third is entertainment, music, and theater, more in the indies, um, and the rest is sort of the cultural, you know, wine tasting parties and, and whatnot. So it, it's a, it's a, we, we consider ourselves to be a community platform rather than a ticketing company. Right, and, um, and there's a lot of events that the tickets are only available on your platform, right? Exactly. They're, they're almost always 100% handled by us, the ticketing part of it. Uh, and thankfully, I don't have a secondary thing to worry about because our customers worry about selling their primary tickets and uh, to get more attendees into the door. Uh, so it's a very, very different model. Uh, and, and quite unusual in Japan. Once again, people may not know, but I think there's very few things like that in Japan. Though yeah, it may I, seem to people that there should be a lot, there really isn't. Yeah, right? um, we, we've done some investigation. We, we feel that segment, although each individual event is quite small, that market, that potential market, that addressable market is probably a lot larger. Right. I can include, you know, wedding parties. I can include my mom's, you know, you know potluck party, or uh, there's just a ton of stuff out there, people convening, uh, getting together. And, and, and it's just a much more interesting, for, at least for me. Yeah. Uh, it has a lot of potential. For and, my and, uh, in that regard, I think Facebook would be our most formidable competitor. And I'm, oh, that's again, interesting. purposely I'm avoiding a fight against right. Ticketmaster or, or right. Lawson. Um, right. But I mean, it, it, from my perspective and actually how I've used your service, is that it really offers small business owners an opportunity to do something. Some guy runs a little, you know, pub or something in Chimokitazawa and yeah. they can offer you know, they can bring in comedians from right. abroad, which doesn't really exist in Japan, and sell tickets through your site. There's, like, there's a lot of possibilities. You know, Pia wouldn't accept that, right? Pia, 
isn't able to do that. And uh, we, we actually, you know, Japan, tourists to Japan increasing at a very fast rate right now. So we have a lot of Chinese tourists going to one of our small events to learn, you know, not just go to the, the big idol concert, but just to learn more about right. cooking or, you know, other aspects of Japan that you might not have um, discovered otherwise. Right. And there's, there, th our customers are happy to pay those fees, whether it be in ticketing fees or, you know, we, we offer uh, what, what's called a boost program to get more attendees into your event. They're, they, they're very happy to pay us the money. If I went after again, uh, uh, you know, Ariana Grande promoter, he's gonna beat me and you know just uh, right. Ticketing fees, I make no money there. Right. And what's even worse, they actually ask for a sponsorship fee. Right. As a startup, I just I don't have the money to do that. Right. So right. Um, I think we've been a little smart in right what we're doing. Well, I mean, I, but my point is I think it's useful for people. You're offering something that I, does, I just, doesn't again, exist in the marketplace. Again, I feel like there are more problems to solve for the little guys right. than for the big guys right. as a right. startup. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it's great. How about Shriyas? Do you have anything like that? Community sort of events? People can create their own events and sell tickets? Sure. Uh, so we do, we do offer people a self-published architecture, but uh, predominantly our vision for Insider is a place to discover entertainment. Um, so we tend to focus on the entertainment segment more on the uh, on the long tail segment. So we have a lot of long tail entertainment, but not um, family events and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, again, uh, self publishing is also like a huge opportunity in India. Right. Right. Absolutely. How about in Hong Kong, Mike? I mean, it's it's a small territory, so you think there would be a lot of community stuff. Yeah, I mean, we, we've we um, held off building what we refer to as a, a roll-your-own solution, largely because of the amount of um, support that we provide to our event organizers. Um, and so the, the amount of uh, hand-holding that they need through the process in terms of choosing the right ticket types, the right pricing points, how they will create the price breaks, and then onto the digital marketing side and the marketing side, we provide an awful lot of, uh, of advice. Whether the economics of that absolutely definitely works is is, is questionable, right. um, but it but it certainly provides a good a good service to our customers. But we are in the process of of building our role your own platform and then releasing that um, with the idea where people could set up the beginnings of the event, um, the the basics of it, and then we would help them to take to take it online. And we 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 have le events of all scales from you know the, the very the very large. Um, international events to the very small, you know, little, as you say, community events, and, and really the idea is that there's no, no event too small or, or, or too big. Uh, our operations team might might disagree, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's useful for the community. We just have a little bit of time left. I just want to see if anybody has any questions. We have four ticketing experts here. It's a crucial part of the music industry. Do we have any questions out there? Anybody would like to ask a question? No questions? Anybody? Don't be shy. Lauren, you have a question? <laughs> you will get a microphone. Hi. Oh. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. We can hear you. OK. Um, I'm Lauren Coker. I work at Sony Music Japan in Tokyo. Um, so did I. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And I know you're a. Uh, friends with the iFlyer guys, so yeah, lots of familiar faces. Um, my question is, I'm more familiar with Japan than any other market, um, but there's no venue uh, ticketing company um, deal in place anywhere, right? Um, the promoters always have 100% full control in who they choose to work with, but it sounds like Hong Kong is maybe a mix of that. So. I don't know who's the expert in this, but if you can, um, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on which Asian markets are led by the venue in terms of ticketing decisions versus led by the event organizer, the promoter, the producer in terms of choosing who they do ticketing with. And then second part of the question, in Japan, you know, Fuji Rock sold tickets through, by the end of it, you know, 12 different companies. <laughs> um, you know, that you go get tickets here and it's 12 companies selling tickets. Uh, so just that versus the idea of an exclusive, 
and whether that's better for the consumer, the organizer, and it's, it's a two-part question. It's interesting because we were, I, I can talk about the Fuji experience because we actually sell tickets for Fuji out of Hong Kong and we're part of that process. We also sell tickets for Summer Sonic and a whole bunch of festivals a, around the region and we see different ways of dealing with it. At Clock and Flat, we, we also sell tickets through lots of different, different channels. Um, and we have a slightly different way of dealing with it than, than what Fuji does. So the biggest challenge that you've got as, a, as, an, as an operator uh, or, or the, 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 the organizer is that you've got to somehow consolidate all of those tickets together um, into one, uh, and, and redeem them at the entrance. So the way that Fuji does it, they have multiple ticketing providers all sitting in their little booth, which is why I know the iFlyer guys, because we it's sit next to each other. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's challenging. The way we do it at Clock and Flap is we do it through technology. So we basically have a platform where we suck in all of the ticket data, the ticket IDs, um, and then we consolidate that and so that anybody can turn up with any kind of barcode and we'll scan that barcode. If the partic particular ticketing provider doesn't have a barcode, then, th then we have a, a dedicated booth where they can go and exchange it for a barcode. We also use RFID uh, access, uh, access control. So, so that, that approach, and I think there's an opportunity there for, for somebody to create that as a, as a platform that will solve this, solve this problem. Because the benefit to us as a promoter is we just get access to these databases, and these databases are huge, you know? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands. I mean, you guys must have a vast database. You guys have got a that's, vast that's database. That's a good segue to my answer, we do that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so so we actually launched, oh, sorry. Please. Yeah, so, so, so I think that's, so you're trading off the convenience of the operation versus, versus this database. And I think technology solves, solves that problem. But in just to, to the first part of your question about the, the, the venues versus the, um, I think every market is, 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 is slightly different. Hong Kong is very much the old school venues locked in to monopolies. Singapore is a, a bit of both. Um, Taiwan seems to be very much locked into, into venues. And as I said earlier on, it's, 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 it doesn't feel healthy. Certainly as a promoter, it doesn't feel healthy. Um, I think you, you're, you're, sh you're shaking your head about the number of different operators. And Sounds totally inefficient. Um, so Australia is built based on the US model where the, the well, team owns the building. So basically the, the venues have the exclusive contracts which they typically go to, to tender for a three to five year uh, contract. And the, the ticketing company then provides commercial and a technology um, offer. And so therefore the technology moves along with uh, at, a, at a more rapid rate than what I've seen in say the UK or other markets because it's part of the deal every three to five years, everything gets refreshed. Um, and it's very efficient because only your tickets are going in and oh, we do all the yeah, same. Yeah, so on this panel, the, we respect so everybody's opinion. Yeah. <laughs> so we so do all the season tickets. We do all the very memberships and yeah, yeah. everything. Um, I, I think the only venue. thing, India doesn't have a venue, so luckily we don't but have you a know, problem. You, you can, you can, the market's open. You can tender for them every three to five years. Um, yeah. All the money's in one place. You know where it is. There's no reconciliation. The consumer knows who they're dealing with. But the promoter can still use other databases and market that's open. There's no, there's no risk so on that. Just, I, I think again, I, I think a lot of these problems have been solved in the travel industry, and somehow we haven't picked it up, right? Uh, global distribution systems is a well-known concept in the travel industry. So what we do is actually we we allow an open API. Um, where if the promoter wants, they can allow any ticketing website to plug into our open API and, and sell through our system. And uh, we give a unique barcode, which is then uh, the same or identifi uh, identifiable across different ticketing promoters. But it's, it's an option with the promoter themselves. Um, and, and second, I, I sorry, I respectfully disagree. All I've seen is uh, lock-in actually reduces innovation. I think an open ecosystem where anyone can pick up inventory and sell it if the promoter is okay with it, I think gives you uh, an ability to innovate more rapidly. I have to be very careful because we're in the process of building white label solutions for venues. So, <laughs> so, so you better be so, careful, Mike. Yeah, exactly, and so they're wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, we probably run out of time, but I really appreciate the uh, frank exchange of, uh, of ideas. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.